On Monday, September 30th, the Worcester branch of Wayne County Public Library was pleased to host author Dr. James Van Kieran. Dr. Van Kieran discussed his book, World War II POW Camps in Ohio. Let's go to the library program, already in progress. What I came up with as the table of contents for the book, and it talks, I talk about the, the Italians arriving, the Germans, and I look at camp life, and I also show the different camps that Camp Perry had outside the base camp. So Camp Perry had, was a base camp for basically Ohio, and then they had 10 branch camps throughout Ohio and a total of over 6,000 POWs, Italian and Germans. And at Camp Perry, they ended up with about 3,000 Germans at the end of the war. So this is, uh, I have to let this move on a little bit here. This is the cover of my book. Let's see what's going on. Um, and in, in this cover, cover of the book, these are, folks that were at Camp Perry. These are Italian prisoners of war, and they came there in October of 1943. And more Italians up there, they're hutments. These are Italians cooking, and these are uh, German officers being transported to various camps throughout the United States. I dedicated this to the women of uh, Camp Perry, Perry Proving Ground, which was adjacent to Camp Perry. I said they were the home front heroes who presided over the prisoners of war in a professional and dignified manner. And the camp commander, Lieutenant Colonel E.C. McCormick, was outstanding. He kept things together in all my research, and he was well respected by his staff and by the POWs. Um, this is POW camps, and let me just stop, stop this for a minute. These are POW camps in the United States. These are, um, you can see, the circles of base camp. So up there it's with the Camp Perry, which was the base camp for Ohio. But I think it's missing something. It's at Camp Perry, had, there should be more British camps in Ohio. This chart has about 668 camps in the United States. Nevada, Montana, North Dakota, and Vermont were states that did not have camps at that time. And this, the reason we did the POW camps was because it was uh, for labor. And people really, uh, we needed labor at that time because folks were in the war and the men had left the country. And so we used the prisoners of war as a labor force. Um, having been from Michigan, the up north part, I'm, I'm assuming that the only thing I can think of would be lumber and iron ore at that time. And um, so you can see that we've been stretched all over the United States, which I really didn't know at the time after I did this research. And it, uh, Ohio, um, there was a camp down in Wilmington, which I'll show real quick there, it just goes through. So this, these would be the camps of Camp Perry, French camps. So you had Camp Perry. At that time, 2,732 Germans. Salina, Defiance, Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, Marion, Columbus Depot, Wilmington, Bowling Green, Ordnance, Crow, uh, General Hospital in Parma, Ohio, Fletcher in, in uh, Cambridge. Um, I'll just stop this real quick because I want to talk about a couple of those. The um, hospitals. Cryo Hospital, General Hospital, was uh, George Washington Cryo was the founder of that hospital, and he was the founder of the Cleveland Clinic. And so they treated over, and I'll have some information there, treated over 15,000 wounded American soldiers that were brought back to the United States. And they had 295 prisoners of war. I was school superintendent down in Guernsey County next door to Cambridge. Fletcher General Hospital, it's in Cambridge, in Cambridge, Ohio, and they had like 168 billion buildings, and they treated uh, over 17,000 wounded soldiers, but their expertise was in orthopedic. It was a center for orthopedic and a trauma center, 
And so in Cambridge, Ohio, they had a, a major work with, with the hospital unit there. Rossford Ordnance Depot, which is up by Toledo, was uh, a depot for transportation. They shipped a lot of vehicles abroad and to, to the Allies and to our, uh, our, our uh, soldiers. Uh, and so that was a huge center for them. Um, the one thing I did find with the Rossford Ordnance Center uh, depot is that once they closed up, uh, they contaminated some of the grounds there. And the Pennant Tech Joint Vocational School and Owens Technical School built on those grounds. And the government had to come in and do some cleanup. Uh, that wasn't bad, and I'll show you some other stuff that's not good. Bowling Green tomato picking, candy. Uh, that was a short period of time that they, they did that. Wilmington was where the Chuck Corn and for hogs. It's a big hog uh, industry down there. And they made 126 POWs, but they were there a short time. Columbus Depot was a packing center uh, where supplies were shipped uh, abroad, and they had 10,000 civilians that worked there at the Columbus Depot. Marion uh, Engineering Depot was uh, where they did uh, rehab machinery. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's a huge center there. And then next door was a silo ordnance plant, which is a part of the, some of those POWs work there. And they made bombs that were sent across the country, across the through abroad. Fort Wayne uh, was again a supply center. Defiance was the manufacturing. They had most of their POWs <coughs> worked in manufacturing. And Salina did uh, was a tomato picking area in Canada. The, uh, the unfortunate thing with this book, this is uh, where a uh, German prisoner of war, they go through interrogation before this, and a German prisoner of war is uh, having an iron cross and a second class cross, uh, second class being removed as he's going through the line. Um, this is interesting because I came across photos at Camp Perry where some of the officers were still wearing the medals. So it must have been maybe some of the camps allowed them to do that. Uh, so they were removing that, and then the next slide will show German officers as they're going through the line, they're receiving their values back, whatever they would have taken from them in the beginning. Uh, they received their valuables back. Uh, as they were getting ready to be transported across the United States to various camps, as you saw. Uh, so there, this would be a photo of those officers and a uh, person taking, giving their valuables back to them. The next slide will show, uh, as soon as it comes up, German POWs boarding the train for camp. Notice the guard on top of the, on top of the train, uh, New York Central. Uh, this was a huge problem for us back then, the transportation. We were not ready to transport POWs across the United States. And as you saw, all those POW camps uh, that were situated in, in across the country. So this took us a, a major effort to transport prisoners of war to these various camps. This is an example of an entrance to a camp. This camp is in Indiana, and probably similar to Camp Perry, uh, the high wire. The guardhouse, and those are a couple of POWs that are being checked as they're re entering the camp. Uh, camp Perry had a similar situation. I've never had any pictures, but from what people told me, it was a similar way like that with high fences uh, prohibiting uh, escapes, even though they did have a couple of escapes that I'll, I'll mention later. Uh, this is what a guardhouse would look like. Uh, camp Perry had 11 guardhouses around the, their, their facility. Um, this was in Indiana. This was uh, apparently Bing Crosby was entertaining the troops there and that were stationed there, and so that was his vehicle that he was uh, parked outside the guardhouse. Uh, from what I could tell, it was, they were pretty well uh, not armed to the T. There may have been some armament. Uh, this was sent by the camp commanders to the camp commanders, and we were really worried about Germans especially. So I highlighted way the work done against reasonable risk, in other words, take the calculated risk. The policy of calculated risk will result in larger reductions of American guard personnel, the majority of whom can be 
transferred to combat units up for action in France. So what happened is the German prisoners of war started uh, running the camps. I mean, they ended up doing uh, kangaroo courts and uh, created some problems. Labor was the main, a real big need for prisoners of war at this time. And um, the main one would be agriculture, which Ohio is, as you can see, it's the land of Bowling Green. North was, was really in high demand. Um, the food processing, again, in our area. The clients had, uh, which we'll show you, <laughs> manufacturing, which they had a lot of their prisoners of war manufacturing. And um, not other non governmental work. And a lot of the POWs um, worked in the camp. Um, some of them went out and worked in outside the agriculture area, but a lot of them stayed there and worked at camps, especially at the Cryo Hospital, Camp Fletcher Hospital, the General Fletcher Hospital, because they needed that help. Uh, but the camp around Bowling or uh, Fort Clinton and North, they were working out in the business areas. This is uh, the Mines Camp, uh, active work projects, and you can see these were the businesses that our, the prisoners of war were working in. Uh, transportation was done by local residents because they were out of work and they, they received money. But you can notice that St. Mary's Packing Company, that, that length of transportation was an hour and a half, half hour for lunch. They're back by five, they leave at five, and they get back at 6.15. Or some of the next one is they have a 50 minute or 10 minute. And so uh, they were, uh, some of them were, were short on transportation, others were lengthy. And I can't imagine how that was with prisoners when they come back to the camp. This was a Camp Perry Strike Report, January 14, 1944. Now, you have to remember, this is when the Italians first came. So there wasn't any outside activity in the community yet, because they just got there in October. So things had to get organized. And so part of it was uh, they did send out prisoners of war to the Gary Proving Ground right here. And that's adjacent, was adjacent to Camp Perry. And they did the uh, artillery. They rehabbed 70% of all the artillery that was sent to the Allies. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the Rossford Ordnance Project was the transportation piece where all the, where the vehicles were rehabbed and sent abroad there. So a lot of it, you can see at that time, architectural or uh, agricultural con uh, contracts were at five, and then the rest of them were pretty were, were uh, within the camp. Uh, confinement, there was one person in confinement. Sick quarters, uh, what's that say, 27, 27 sick quarters, sick in the hospital, and there was a hospital adjacent to the camp that was used uh, by, by Camp Perry. So this was, um, this fake report, and then it changed obviously when uh, the Germans came in June of 19, uh, 1944. And then the Italians left and the Germans occupied it until 1946 when they were sent back uh, to their country. So Camp Perry had canteens. They had two canteens there. These are Italians that are uh, at the canteen and supposedly the research person that sent the gig that said they were drinking soda. Later I read that uh, they served beer there, but not in the beginning. And they had they used script. In other words, they when they worked in inside, they received a little bit of money, uh, 10 cents a day. Uh, if they went outside work, it was 80 cents a day plus the 10 cents. So this was an example of the script they used that they would have gone to the canteen and given to the people that were in the canteen uh, as, as money. And this was uh, used by all the prisoners of war once all of this became established. And so the value of, the value of this is one dollar uh, that they turned in to receive uh, if they went to the canteen or if they went to the PX or whatever. They had lots of casual time activities. Uh, at POWs uh, are playing cards at this time. You know, if you look at the, PO, the POWs here, they look pretty healthy, don't they? 
they don't look emaciated or uh, not really, you know, pretty good diet, apparently. And we'll, we'll see that, and then I have a counter to that. Uh, so they had time they could do that, um, and playing cards, and then they also had game, other games that played in game rooms. This was a Italian POW painting that uh, was done, and it was given to the Ottawa County Historical Museum, and then in turn, uh, from a, a, a donor who had received it from her parents, uh, her father, when he served at Camp Perry. So, not that hard, pretty good, and uh, it's on display at the Ottawa County Historical Museum. That is a nativity scene that was done by an Italian prisoner of war from Strap Wood. And uh, so they were given freedoms to do activities and art. And the Italians were really uh, very active with those kinds of things. Um, yes. So uh, this was again in uh, from the Outer County Historic Museum, an example of the activity or time that they spent uh, at the camp. That was positive. These are Germans that were grinding meat. And what happened is the POWs ran in kitchens. So when the Italians were there, you saw pictures on the cover of the book. The Italians were cooking at that time. So these are Germans at Camp Ferry that are grinding meat for, for their dinner and putting that together. And there's a whole, in the book, there's a whole series of pictures of, uh, of prisoners of war, Germans uh, preparing food. This is uh Sir, that guy looked like he worked out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean you look at the pictures of, of the Jews, you know, from the Holocaust, and yeah, then look well, at these guys. Just think of like, just think of our uh soldiers that came back. I had at a couple of presentations I've done, I've had uh, people that their parents their father was in a concentration camp. And she said she came back ninety pounds. And uh, another, the uh, first time in uh, Brook Park, uh, someone said the same thing, that they came back emaciated and just really uh, terrible. Uh, I put this in the book, Germans start pride in their cooking these recipes from their homeland. And this was done from a reporter, Fort Clinton, who went to the camp ferry and talked about a prisoner baker opened door at the oven. Uh, the smell was something that I cannot could not be described. I got the prisoner to open the door a couple of times, sensing my pleasure at the aroma he grinned. And then you, he goes on, and then you can see that Strasso Kupen, that prisoner volunteer, it's no good, eh? For fleeting water, I was tempted to remain behind and become a volunteer prisoner. At least until the Kupen was completely baked and sampled, but I did get a taste of it. Uh, so again, the Germans were running their own kitchens, uh, with supervision from uh, our soldiers, and uh, same with the Italians, but the, the Germans came with, with a lot of cooking background, apparently, because uh, if you look at the pictures, you can see that uh, um, all of these folks were pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. This is uh, German, <laughs> this is headlines in the newspaper. This like for free two beer. Uh, and prisoners apparently don't like free two beer. With cigarettes, they were called spuds, so I thought, well, what are those? And I looked it up, and they were meant, the first menthol cigarettes by Lloyd, made, done by Lloyd Spud of Nagel Junction, Ohio, and down by Steubenville. So this was, uh, and then you can see rows of empty cases testified to them, what, what they like. Now take a, take a look at this. This is, this was more camp uh, in Fort Wayne, and this was just a, what I told as a daily menu. Um, looks not bad. I almost I showed my wife this menu. Uh, no, not really. I'm just kidding. Uh, coffee for breakfast, fresh fresh milk, sugar, milk with cornflakes, bread, beef broth with eggs, spaghetti, scrambled eggs, lettuce with dressing, spinach, bread, coffee, milk, and sugar. Goulash, salt, potatoes, peas, scrambled eggs, lettuce with dressing, bread, coffee, milk, and sugar. Why did they get coffee and sugar? Yeah, because everything was being rationed at that time. Right, my parents and, uh, about not Well, and a lot of the articles back then were saying that the prisoners of war here were coward. 
they were given more than they would have at home. So I had a person come up to me at one of my uh, last week, and his father had been a POW and had written a memoir about his experiences in Munich, Germany, which was up in northern Germany. And so I just took from what he said about food. Food supply was very little. The fare for one day started with boiled broccoli tea in the morning. At noon, there was more boiled broccoli tea and about a fourth of a slice of bread, uh, dark and sour. In the evening, at supper time, there was more solid food. This consisted of one bite of horse meat, one tablespoon of salt or sugar, two one-inch diameter potatoes, a cup of cabbage soup, the salt or sugar ration came only a couple times a week. He wrote from his experience, because he came back, this is the person that came back at 80 for 90 pounds, the American prisoners of war were losing about three to four pounds of, a week from malnutrition. Weakness from not enough food would soon bring on diseases with dirty conditions and no vets. So you look at what this was, what, what we did, and you know, we're, this country has always been very good at treating their prisoners and everybody. And then what this person went through uh, was was bad. He also wrote about work. Germans did pay the workers, but worthless cigarette papers and matches, but no tobacco. So they gave them the paper and the matches without tobacco. Work parties ceased when the prisoners, prisoners got too weak to do any more work. So, you know, we treated our, our prisoners real well, and then you have these experiences of people that uh, came back and then, you know, totally skeletons. And in Fort, in Fort Clinton, there's newspaper articles about coddling the prisoners of war. As a matter of fact, they went to the camp and protested because the food was so much better. This is a hut at Camp Perry. Um, it's the exact size of what you're sitting in right now. I measured it up, 256 square feet. So this is what five prisoners of war from back to front to side would be saying in. And um, so someone said, well, you know, the American prisoners of war had tenants a hut like this. So I thought, well, maybe this wasn't, uh, was pretty good for them. They had a hot belly stove that, they had, uh, that was there that heated the place. And then in the winter, of course, it was cold coming off the lake. This would have been a uh, list of calls for Camp Perry. So the prisoners were up at uh, assembly at 6, mess hall at 6.05. And these would be the ones that are staying on camp, because this was October. Uh, 12th, 1943, and the Italians came over October 1, so this was just the start of it. But you can see that they held to a military kind of thing. Mail call at Camp Perry, we had mail call, prisoners of war. Uh, this is an example at Camp Perry of a mail call where mail is being distributed to prisoners of war. And a lot of time, time, in the book, I had uh, letters that were sent by, translated, that were sent out by German prisoners of war. And one of them I had was some part of it censored. But this was a highlight of the prisoner war receiving mail. And of course, before it came in, it was censored. This was a uh, letter that I had translated, or a card I had translated. I can report with great joy that I received mail from you for the first time. You can certainly imagine at home how happy I was. I regret I'm only able to write a little card, but as soon as possible, I'll write a letter. Your dear note from a month ago for a month of December, I thank you again. Greetings, Warren. They were allowed only nine lines on the postcard and 23 lines on the left. And normally they were allowed to do this once a week. Now, Erie Proving Grounds, that's where the crew fire shipped overseas 70% of the mobile artillery for the United States and Allies. And they still have at the Erie Proving Ground uh, where they crew fired out into Lake Erie for the artillery. So this was a major operation. They had 5,000 civilians working there, uh, 1,000 POWs working at this site, and Fort Clinton became a hub of trying to take care of all of these uh, civilians of the working there. Uh, you can see that more than 90,000 artillery units of all calibers were shipped from there uh, for more than three years. They had an average 50 
real cars and 70 truck loads were shipped daily. At the start of the battle of Bulge, uh, 170 railroad cars went on in a single day, and they had 5,000 people in plus over 1,000 Italian BMWs that worked there that managed this major operation. But where do you put all the people? So the federal government created the Erie Grounds in Fort Clinton, the federal complex of 259 two family homes in which they housed uh, civilians, and the civilians could rent or buy those at a discounted cost. And they still have some of them there, and they have the common grounds. They have house here, two houses here, two houses here, they share the backyard. Also, the residents of Fort Clinton were asked to house civilians that worked at the Erie Proving Ground. So the majority of the people in Fort Clinton did house uh, a lot of the civilians, the 5,000 there. Uh, the Italians were called belligerents in 1943, fall of 1943. So they received privileges that the Germans did not. They were allowed to visit. In this case, visit outside. In this case, they visited the Toledo Museum of Art. Uh, they were going to visit Sandusky, Ohio, but a congressman from Sandusky wrote Washington and said they should not be leaving the camp, and we stopped that. Uh, so there, so this was, uh, I came across this in the newspaper, I thought it was kind of interesting, because this was uh, Italians, and this was a, uh, what was set up at, Eric Proving Grounds had dorms for residents, for the civilians, but they also created a day hut. And it was uh, set up for uh, Italian service unit members. This, once again, they received privileges. And when they worked outside, they received 80 cents uh, a day plus 10 cents at, at, at home in the camp. So they, so they created a cafeteria, recreation hall, reception hall that was available, plus rooms furnished as close to home as possible. There were three smaller rooms for entertaining one to two guests. Local girls could use these rooms if they had dates, and parents could, uh, could uh, send them, visit the girls and their dates. Toledo had a huge Italian population. So what happened is a lot of the Italian girls were transported to Fort Clinton to be a part of this uh, data. And um, then in turn, the Italian prisoner of war were went to Toledo because they had the, all of these centers there and participated in a lot of the activities. A lot of the folks that were involved in this came back and married uh, people that took the girls that were uh, in uh, Fort Clinton and several newspaper articles they came across. And I guess that happened too with some of the German prisoners of war. This was the Columbus Depot. This was, you notice here, these are German POWs, and you have a guard watching them. Now, if this was Italian, you probably would not have anybody watching them. Uh, out in the workplace, you probably would not have anybody watching them. Um, so, this uh, 10,000 people, civilians in Columbus, worked there, and this was a supply center that they sent across to Europe and to the Allies, and uh, it was a major hub. This was the uh, camp, get, understand this, branch camps under Camp Perry. Uh, POW Camp Wilmington was uh, one for where they shuck the corn and produce it to the hogs there. And these are German POWs that are on break at the camp. The camp was not there for a very long period of time. Uh, they slept in tents. Most of the branch camps they were in tents. And um, then they were done at the fall of the at Lucky Strike Crops, was that for Lucky Strike Cigarettes? Yes. Oh, wow. Trial Hospital in Parma, Ohio. Uh, 153 acres, 10,000, 100 buildings, treated over 15,000 soldiers. And up above here is where the POW came out, were housed there. And then those were all the buildings at, at Trial Hospital. And today it's the western campus of Tri C. Tri Community college. This was a POW uh, hut at our hospital with an example of where they stayed uh, in, at the hospital. Um, they were not allowed outside the hospital, they were only within the hospital working and assisting with those activities. But there did, uh, something did happen there. Um, we'll go, I'm going to go quick here. For a guard shot prisoner of war. Um, 1945, they were a guard down in kind of 
into it with a German prisoner of war, a guy who lost his balance and uh, rushed by the prisoner and shot the uh, prisoner of war. Uh, the guard went through a, a court martial proceeding, was found not guilty. Uh, that was basically one of the only ones that I could find that, uh, that where there was, there was violence like that, other than there were strikes that happened. And prisoners of war that died at, at, at the camp were basically sent to Indiana. This was a uh, uh, our government set up, uh, out a newspaper in March of 1945 to all the camps. And it was a propaganda piece to try to bring in uh, the uh, our educate our prisoners of war. And this was posted in Camp Perry uh, by a uh, Nazi prisoner of war, which they were upset with this newspaper. So they're saying boycott it, the shameful paper. Uh, so then we did re education programs. My priority was to instill in the minds of few of us a respect for American institutions, traditions, ways of life, and thought before our being repatriated. This was a, a class that was being conducted. Camp Perry had classes in English, history. Uh, also, they had a uh, situation with the uh, dean of uh, Toledo, uh, University of Toledo, the College of Education, where they be allowed to do college credits. This was the internal newspaper at Camp Perry that was sent to uh, the base camps, to the base camp, was to the branch camps. Uh, in this newspaper, they had lots of activities that listed movies that were, they could see. They had a uh, auditorium in House 900 uh, that they could see a movie. Uh, they had other activities. They played tennis. They played soccer. They had teams. So they had scores and competition within within the newspaper. But this is a German joke I came across. It's out of water and wine. Water alone makes one mute, as proven by fish and water. Wine pure makes one stupid, dense, as proven by the gentleman at the next table. But since I don't want to be either, I mix water and wine. Uh, this was an example of German humor that was in the newspaper, and there were other little sections of German humor at that time in the newspaper. And the newspaper only lasted for about six months because then they were uh, set back home. This was a declaration by a German prisoner of war at Camp Perry against what had happened in the, in the war. Like he was saying here, uh, time to reorganize a new German, to bring people together, to forget the military rule that was in the past that ruled over the people, and when you go home they've got to rebuild Germany. It's not a military goal. So you can see the newspaper kind of uh, changed the philosophy. People were starting to see that Germany was defeated and that uh, the time was to regroup and look to the new Germany. They had, uh, there were, I had a chapter on POW and happiness because uh, I put a phrase down here, Nazi prisoners pushed some of the prisoners to the breaking points, leading to strikes, escapes, and most tragically, some prisoners taking their own lives as the only uh, as the only way out. So there was a, a couple of instances in which they had a, a strike, and there was one at uh, Camp Perry that they had uh, um, they had three strikes there. So that I put in the book. Uh, third strike occurred during the same time uh, as some of the others uh, went. 2,200 German prisoners of war went on strike, again with a perceived rigid discipline at the camp. In similar fashion, these striking prisoners were placed on a bread and water diet after their three-day strike was over. Uh, when they were forced to go back and clean up the camp and go back to their designated work. Um, there was also a, a strike at Camp Perry and uh, Camp Perry and same thing happened. There were some escapes and the ones I noted as, uh, this was in the June 1, 1945 Ottawa County News article uh, recounted the event. Two prisoners were, who escaped from the Australia plant where they were working lost last week were apprehended in downtown Columbus on Thursday. Uh, a discharged soldier recognized GI shoes that they were wearing and noticed the prisoners were crossing the intersection against the red light. <laughs> uh, there was a they had a suicide there. Another, a prisoner 
who escaped from Camp Curry on August 25th, 1945, was hanging in a tree near Willow Creek, Fort Clinton, on October 5th. Camp officials described him as mentally unbalanced until that day his, uh, when his body was found. The only other German prisoner of war who had successfully, but it was, he was the only one successfully escaped from Camp I mean, in Camp Curry, but then committed suicide. So, you know, there's tightness in the camp, you, you have a rigid situation, and you're away from home, and then you have Germans that are uh, kind of pushing the prisoners to see the old way and forcing them to uh, and forcing them to do things that they don't want to do, torturing. This was uh, Camp Mary, which was a rehab of machinery, and when the prisoners came to Camp Mary, Mary and they were deloused with Lysol and deloused with arsenic. And so I highlighted maintenance and repair of every equipment, washing and lubrication of vehicles they were involved with, and um, they left that behind in this very labor school district for uh, Then in set of ordinance plan, they did work with the general cleanup. So I have a chapter of contamination on the home front. And this is Marion County. Over a 30 year period, they had 151 deaths of leukemia. And at the high school, they had a high, high rate of leukemia deaths. And so there was lots of investigations, and they tried to connect that with what happened there. And uh, the government didn't connect it. But I put together, I put together a, a document that I think I've got connected, and I may publish that. This was the uh, River Valley Local School District in 2005. Uh, these were the athletic fields that were contaminated, and here's the government is digging up those athletic fields because of the contamination. They were chained off. Students uh, didn't have athletic fields because of the contamination. And they sat there for six years trying to decide whether or not to build new schools, and finally they did in 2003 and had to move off the site. But then I just wanted to show a dramatic kind of picture of what happened there. And the last one here is uh, this is the administrative center at uh, Camp Perry. And this was there when the POWs were there. That was where they had the barber shops, they had the, the canteen in there. Today, it's the offices, offices of Camp Perry with all of the activities going. And uh, the National Guard trains there today. And the civilian marksmanship program is one of the largest programs in the, the, the country. So they're very active with that. Um, when the Hutmans were in good shape, the civilian marksmanship program people stayed within uh, those that. Those cutments. So that's kind of it. Um, it was uh, interesting. I uh, have a chapter in there about the residents, how they viewed the, the prisoners of war. A lot of them had good relationship with them. Uh, a friend of mine who, uh, two, quite a few years ago, was uh, going to fraud and was in Germany, was going on a tour, and the guy was talking with him. He said, um, Well, you know, we're from Ohio. He said, Oh, I was a POW at Camp Perry. And he said, I was treated very well there. Uh, so that was, that was kind of interesting. So, any questions that you may have about the presentation or if you'd like to comment? Yes, sir. Uh, when the war was over, how were the prisoners dispatched? They were repatriated uh, by June 30th, 1946, back to their country. Um, there was 371 that were left in prisons. Uh, I think 341 Germans, 25, 29 Italians, and one Japanese. But they were all gone by June 30th of uh, 1946. Yes, sir. Uh, did they allow them to keep their, like they had like Nazi insignia? You the know, they did. And okay. They could do that within the Hutman. I read where they had that posted and inside the Hutman. They weren't, quite, they weren't allowed to wear it, but they did have postings of like that. You mentioned that they died, then they were sent to Yeah, Indiana had a burial spot there for prisoners of war, which I was really... The cemetery is still there. Yes, it is. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned about the, the prisoners doing work on um, military devices and stuff like that. Isn't that kind of asking them to... Yeah, you know what? At uh, Sayota Ordnance Plant, where they didn't make bombs, Geneva Convention said they, they could not do any kind of bomb making. And guess what? They 
skirted the rules and they had them on the assembly lines making big the lines. Didn't the Geneva Convention also say that the prisoners couldn't do work? Uh, that got waived because they were all, that's why we brought them over here just to work. As long as they were treated, and they were treated well, as you can see. What about the, um, the classes, the, uh, you know, the indoctrination? Wasn't that against the Geneva Convention too? Sure, it was. So we didn't follow that religiously. No, we didn't. We did that. <laughs> Um, anything else? Yes, sir. Sounds like prisoners were a lot, of, lot better off here than they were. They here. were, absolutely. Yes. So we trained them for the jobs. Right. And we took care of We the educated them, too. And yes. So I, I can remember my grandfather, I was born and raised in Minnesota. My grandfather, maternal, was a farmer and also worked in. With the railroad for 50 years, walking out to the same hall we had. And then, so he got extra rations for gas because uh -huh. he was farming. My other grandfather was a minister, so he got extra rations because he was good to be in the world of hospital or whatever. But they did without like sugar and coffee and things right. that were rationed, but they they ate well because of the farming community. Right. But, this really is disturbing when you see this it picture. Is. It is. And um, never realized it. And then this has been on a couple of talks I've done. People have said, well, look at this. And then the person at the last time I was going to go on gave me some documents and said, this is what happened to my father. Well, then I just visited the Holocaust Museum that was in Detroit. And the horror of watching the video books and watching this. Is that the Maltz Museum? Yes. Um, I was just horrified. Our, our American actors and actresses changed their names. Right. So they didn't be recognized as Jews. Right. I was just like, huh? What? Well, you know, I was in, in uh, Camp Perry, they showed updated films. Of, of course, they were in English, but um, of known actors at that time, and uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, they really. The Germans finally repudiated what was going on in their country, and so they became a little more docile than in the beginning. In the beginning, they were really hardcore, it caused lots of problems. Uh, in the end, they were happy to be where they were and ready to go home. Yes, sir. You mentioned that they had the Italian person in the German court. They should be Italian. They, what they did with the Italians is they moved them to the Erie Proving Ground. Next door. And then they moved the rest of them to the Rossford Ordnance Depot up in Toledo there. So they moved all the Italians up. But one time we had Italian and German prisoners of war there together with the road dividing. Can you imagine? <laughs> they had their own showers and cafeteria and that kind of thing. But there was just a road that divided the two groups. And then they finally, as they moved it to the Earth Cruiser Grounds and the Rossford Ordnance Center, then it became about 3,000 Germans. Yes, sir. Question about the contamination. Uh, yes. What, what, they were digging out all the dirt. Yeah. Um, the what triggered it? I was, as I was doing this research, I came across that uh, River Valley Local School District in Marion, Ohio, where the Marion uh, engineering Depot was, uh, bought 78 acres of property from the Marion Engineering Depot. And the Marion Engineering Depot had left debris, burn pits and everything, and then they covered it and buried it there. They also had a POW camp there. Uh, so this whole ground, lots of contamination in it. And the school district bought 78 acres and built a mill school and high school on it. And uh, not knowing that the grounds were contaminated. So what came about it, uh, about 20 years later, all of a sudden they had a high rate of leukemia for the students and the graduate. And one student, I'm, I'm doing a book on this, by the way. <laughs> uh, one student trying to show what the cover-up was and what government and how it, uh, maybe there was incompetence. Um, so the one student I interviewed was a friend of my daughter's, uh, has a brain tumor, and he believes that what's from the going to school there, he said when he ran track, uh, and did band, they marched on these, 
that digging up was done. And he said when he threw the discus, he said it was just buried. And then a couple of students ran track and they said they would run through SWAT and dry kinds of dip that was wet. So uh, so they did a lot of uh, a lot of inspections there. They did 90 government reports, and I've gone through most of them. And uh, I had a, a, there's a couple of people that were technicians that were hired to do that, and they refuted what the government said that they had found. And uh, there was one person that uh, was a radiation technology technician. He said he found radiation there because they had all kinds of radiation stored at Camp Mary. They had uh, 50,000 um, MET scopes, which there were night vision scopes that were had radium in it. And then they had arsenic, or they had uh, asbestos there. So, uh, and then I did went through some interviews that were done, and some of the people said they saw stuff being buried and pushed as they were doing the school grounds. So it just triggered a new interest for me. But yeah, that's what this was. And, uh, so this, this student said he believes it was that uh, it happened from the time he was going to school. So what year was that? That would have been, it would, uh, that opened in 1940. Well, the school, the school brought the property, the high school, they bought the property in 1961, uh, 78 acres for $23,000. And the high school was completed in 1963, and the junior high was completed in 1968. So then, then in, were you there, Mary? Oh. I was he? Did it any repercussions? No. Oh. From cancer. Yeah, it's in 1997 all this broke. This is when the, the new school nurse uh, at, at the high school said, well, we have a high rate of cancer there. And um, uh, so she kind of did it. And then Paul Jaco, who was an EPA person assigned to that, particular camp, that situation, to oversee the, the review of it, uh, was fired. And uh, because he claimed the government was covering up that. So it went to a, a federal court, and the judge reinstated him, said the government couldn't do that, and, re and uh, received his uh, back pay and everything, but he was reassigned to it. But he blew the whistle that said this place was contaminated. Uh, so anyway, I i have got a bit of research on it and talked to some people. And I mean, I think I'm doing a book on it. I'm close to doing it with a pub this publisher right here. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, regard to the rank in the UAW? Yes. The uh, officers didn't have to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. They did not have to work. Good point. Uh, the privates, uh, they had to work. So the officers, they could work if they want, but they didn't have to. And they provide them with translators to interpret? Well, what happened is that a lot of the, uh, some of the Germans were used as uh, interpreters for the, for the guards and everything. Because we didn't have anybody here to do that. So, but, and some of the Italians, those that were favorable to what was going on. Anything else? Yeah, there's still those huts up that can't bear. Yeah, you seen those? Yeah. yeah, there's like, um, I don't know, 12 Italian and maybe 18 or so Germans. So did you ever look inside? No, nah, we never were. Yeah. <laughs> so not the... yeah, they had a hot belt. So this is it. You, you're, this is your hot right here. Five uh, men staying in the hot belt with a hot belly stove. And then the winter I read that was freezing. <laughs> Basically, that means that normal people at the time. Right. Yep. I do have a book for sale if you're interested. Um, Fifteen dollars uh, at the bottom line. It's twenty one ninety nine. So if you would be interested, I've got some here. Um, anything else to go to the order? Well, and meanwhile, there's all these ads about. Have the victory gardens. Recycle your tin cans. Do this and do that to help our troops. And meanwhile, the POWs. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, very idle. Basically, these single parent moms are working in the factories, raising the kids, doing the victory gardens, recycling, sewing the kids' clothes. 
No uh, nylons. <laughs> and I wrote a book about my father-in-law. Uh, he was in an evacuation hospital unit. And he went across Europe, and so I traced him across Europe. And um, in the end, they treated over 30,000 wounded soldiers. And evacuation hospitals hop like this. One would hop over another and hop over, hop over another. And they ended up in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. And when they went into Pilsen, up on the hill, these are from the translations I've got, uh, there was a whole German tank group up there, cancer group. And they came down and surrendered to the hospital unit. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a hospital unit. They really didn't have soldiers. My father-in-law was not a, you know, he worked as a hospital person. And so um, then they stayed there for about three months in treatment. Soldiers, but yeah, his his experience. He never talked to us about it at all. Uh, I was bound and determined to find out about it, and so I did. I came across some um, videos that were done of veterans that had been in that unit and were interviewed, and so I translated them. I had someone translate these were in English, but I had them because there was an audio video. I had someone do that, so I had a section on that. So I was kind of fun to do. So just recently, I got a. Several people have emailed me, a lot of people have emailed me from the unit, the parent family. And so I did receive an email from a, uh, a family that said their aunt was the chief nurse of that unit. And um, so they sent me a lot of materials, and then I came across another lady that had been in that unit, and their family sent me a unit. So I'm redoing the book, I'm reprinting it, and I'm adding a section on nurses, a big section, lots of photos for it. Anyway, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> yes. I can remember I was born on um, October 44, so towards the end of that. I can remember um, my grandmother raised three sons and 11 other friends' sons during the war, and every one of them made it back. Really? And but the next door neighbor. He was a prisoner of war. Then yeah. I don't remember. They said when he came back, he was just in a boat. Yeah. yeah. My father in law was over there for three years and didn't see his wife. Was, he saw his son just before he left him, and three years later. And he, it was really traumatic and he had major kind of emotional problems the rest of his life. When, uh, when I was born, they sent a picture to my two uncles. And before they all passed, they gave me Really? That's and my nice. one uncle, he was on Tenement Island, he wrote my name on the belly with a 29 ball line. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> and cool. he's standing in front of it. That's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. really neat. Anything else? Thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you'll learn a little something.